Jordan Mann, and I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University and a faculty fellow with the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. So I'm going to host our webinar today. The uh, title is, Will Local Foods and Technical Change Alter the Urban Form? So I want to welcome everybody to our webinar. Uh, thank you for participating. Um, before we get started, I want to point out a couple items. So first is we are recording the webinar. Um, the recording will be available in a couple of days and we'll have it posted on the NCRCRD website. So I've got the URL in the chat box. I also put my email in the chat box in case you've got any uh, questions post webinar. Um, the presentation itself is going to last about 20, 25 minutes and we'll have about 10 to uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers. So as your questions uh, come up um, and other feedback, please type it into the chat box. So finally, we've got several questions for you in the audience to uh, respond to, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll give us as much of your feedback as you're willing to share. So thanks again for participating. So our presentation team includes uh, Spencer Thompson. He's our primary presenter today. He's an undergraduate student here at Michigan State University and for the past year has taken a, a pretty deep dive into research about agricultural technologies with a special focus on potentially disruptive innovations like automation, robotic, robotics, et cetera. And so he's going to use the term smart implements to describe these. So um, we're hoping to get some feedback on that from you. Um, Scott Leverage is uh, also with us. He's uh, currently the interim chair for the Department of uh, Fisheries and Wildlife at MSU, and he's also a professor here in the uh, Department of Agriculture, Agricultural, Food, and Resource Economics. Um, and also, I'm on this research team, so that's uh, my participation as well. Um, so Spencer is now going to engage you more on the following question. Will local foods and technical change um, alter the urban form? So Spencer, go ahead and take it away. Hello, and uh, thank you all for being here. Let me uh, thank Scott and John for uh, letting me present my work for them, and it's been a really great experience, and uh, yeah, so we'll get started very well. So, uh, Will Local Foods and uh, Technical Chain Alter the Urban Form is the title of our webinar, and just a little bit about our webinar. Um, we would like to identify possible scenarios regarding local foods and advanced greenhouses, which we call smart implements. We use this as a kind of uh, catch-all term to describe a variety of advanced technologies that automate farms, and uh, this may be, and we get into this later more in the webinar. Uh, please help us with your feedback on polls and in the chat box, and feel free to engage in you know a little bit of speculation here. There's a lot of unknowns with these technologies, and we think there's a lot of exciting possibilities with these technologies. Um, so. To begin our presentation, we're going to start with just going over uh, what vertical agriculture and urban agriculture. So in your, vertical agriculture in the 21st century can be uh, relatively advanced. Uh, this is a sample of what vertical agriculture looks like here in the fo uh, photo here, and we have a, a few more throughout the presentation. Uh, it allows high yield on low space. Energy efficiency and productivity varies based on the technologies used, however. Now this has some advantages, uh, producing higher yields on fewer inputs, though vertical agriculture can often be more expensive to construct. And as we move forward in the 21st century, a lot of these smart implements and other advanced technologies can be applied to vertical and urban agriculture. Urban agriculture in particular helps uh, provide fresh and local food all year long, and they can use these advanced technologies as mentioned before. Um, this is a farm in Brooklyn, New York, uh, Gotham Greens. They have a variety of locations throughout the New York area, as well as um, a few in Chicago. They are not the only farms, uh, but they're one example. You can see here that the, um, they're located just on the rooftop here, but other technologies might allow them to be located in more warehouse-style structures instead of just on the roof. And the primary advantages of uh, rooftop agriculture is the ability to you know, use solar heating and um, unused space. So traditional farms have been facing um, a couple of different problems in recent years, which may give a slight edge to uh, these advanced urban farms in the future and in the 21st century when coupled with these advanced technologies. And the primary one is the problem with labor supply. Uh, the average age of farm laborers is increasing for traditional farms, um, as well as the average cost of labor. You can, this graph here shows the average 
uh, uh, age of the laborers increasing overall, and uh, from the USDA. And the second image here shows the average cost of farm labor increasing pretty much across the board. Um, and this is an increasing problem for you know challenging uh, farmers' profits and the, their ability to maintain uh, operation. So urban farms have a general sample of uh, have a general variety of technologies that they can kind of use here um, to help compensate for the higher cost of construction and the built and having to maximize yield on far less space. Um, the basic ones already in operation here you can see are like ventilation systems, uh, hydroponic systems, or aeroponic systems, uh, advanced cooling systems, some sort of renewable energy, often solar, though wind can be used in certain areas, and heat capture and rainwater capture, really uh, a variety of technologies, and these are the more basic level of technologies that are being used already. But these can be taken to the next level with uh, computers and uh, increased robotics and automation. So this is an example of uh, one of those more traditional uh, uh, urban farms. They use uh, aeroponics. Um, they have increased yield, fewer inputs, and more precision. Aerial farms is the name of the uh, farm there. And um, they're located in Newark in New Jersey. And you can see here they use uh, there's very many grow boxes stacked on top of each other, and the inside of the grow box is actually on the next slide. So we can see, take a look inside. So they use uh, aeroponics here, which they claim reduces 95% uh, less water than field crops and 40% less than hydroponics, and it's becoming increasingly popular. Um, and they grow a variety of leafy grains, uh, which is pretty common with these farms is uh, either lettuce products or um, other specialty crops like tomatoes, um, more high value crops in general. Uh, so as we move uh, into the future, we have a new variety of uh, farming implements which can be used. But before we go there, um, we just like to see ask if anyone has seen any of these technologies. Um, described here, or anything similar. And please feel free to place where in the chat if you have seen them, um, and you, you know your thoughts on them. Any uh, initial thoughts or things like that? So a couple of people are typing, but I know, don't know if they're typing in for chat. So maybe we should just keep moving. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, pretty, pretty interesting split here, about 50-50, and we'll continue to uh, move on. Um, so as I said, uh, while all these technologies can improve efficiency, there's still room for improvement, especially but not only in regards to labor. And this brings us to smart implements. So. These are just a few examples of smart implements, and they're advanced agricultural technologies that significantly automate the agricultural production process. Um, and smart attachments, might they might be relatively minor, like these smart attachments to tractors. The engaged zone control prevents overseeding by uh, using computer systems to not seed the same area twice when you're driving, your GPS technology. Um, sweeper harvesting in the center here uses um, advanced, it's an automated pepper picker, it uses a saw and such and scanners to find fresh peppers in the greenhouse, cut them, harvest them, and then place them in a train for production. And then finally we have a variety of farm management systems. This one is called B2Crop and it uses advanced sensors to maximize the efficiency of all inputs in a farm from fertilizer to irrigation to pesticides. Now, 
we can't just call them robots because they're, they're not all robots, but some are. Uh, however, the vast majority of these technologies aren't quite at the robot level. They're not thinking um, or they're making very limited decisions or they don't actually use robotics like the smart implement sensors. Um, however, they're all still automating farms and reducing inputs in agriculture, which is why we categorize them um, as more of that catch-all term. It doesn't mean robots don't apply for uh, some of the more advanced technologies like the sweeper um, that use robotics, but they're not all uh, on that robot plane yet. They're not R2D2. So, uh, Iron Ox is an automated greenhouse um, out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and they also grow leafy greens um, using smart implements here. They use uh, helpers uh, like that to scan, harvest, and cultivate the crops. Uh, they monitor their health through the sensors, and then they use the grippers there to harvest and manipulate the crops as needed through a variety of things in the production process. Sweeper has gone through before is another automated pepper picker, uh, um, another, uh, and it does the same task, except instead of leafy greens, it's focused on peppers. Uh, interestingly enough, it can't use um, a hand to grip them as to like how we would pick it off. It might use a hand to hold the pepper afterwards, but the dexterity is still a really important issue with these machines. They can't quite replicate the dexterity of the human hands. So they have to use other methods, such as using a saw to cut through the pepper stem. And finally, we have uh, more advanced farm management systems. This is just a one called climate control systems. It does the same thing as um, uh, bee to crop, but it's more specialized for indoor farms. It uses sensors throughout the greenhouse to automatically adjust inputs for maximum efficiency. Precision application equals fewer inputs for farms and helps reduce their costs. So uh, before we move to the next category, I'd like to ask um, first, what do we think of uh, the term smart implements in general as that catch-all term, as well as question three, well, do you think smart implements will aid, disrupt, or have no impact on local and regional food systems? Before we move into that section, I'd just like to get initial uh, feeling. Now, if, as people are answering that, maybe take a look at the chat here. Um, Megan says um, a startup cost might be daunting. What, did, what have you seen about that in your view of the literature? I, uh, the startup costs are definitely uh, very high. Um, the, most companies keep the exact price of their products under tight wrap, um, but they are continuing to move forward in both traditional agriculture and in these advanced greenhouses, which are spreading, um, but it definitely requires significant capital investment. Uh, unfortunately, due to their nature, most of their finance data isn't publicly available. And yeah, aquaponics is also another really interesting application. Uh, the Economist had an article about uh, partially automating it back in 2016. Yeah, so we got an interesting uh, spread here. We have uh, uh, some saying no and marginal impact, and some uh, believing that they will aid them, which is uh, quite interesting, actually. Um, it's a relatively, so far, relatively positive or neutral uh, interpretation of these machines. So while those polls are continue, I'll just move into the Smart Implements Vertical Agriculture and Local Foods System. So uh, advanced greenhouses can kind of combine all these technologies. They can move from greenhouse sensor systems uh, and partner them with uh, you know, robotics and, thing, and uh, things like Ironox and a variety of other smart implements to automate the cultivation and the monitoring of the crops. And they can combine these and um, use them to maximize automation and reduce labor if labor becomes an issue as it's been showing on traditional agriculture and as it's showing in um, advanced agriculture as well. And they can produce local food all year long. Now an interesting little thing here is that it's, uh, this is actually Iron Ox's produce as you can see and it says grown with love in San Carlos. Um, but the robots are doing all the harvesting, which means, at least from what we can see, that their initial marketing approach isn't trying to play up the automation so much, at least in storefronts. Uh, they might be relying on that marketing more online, as we can see, to create buzz. But 
in the storefronts, they're still relying on relatively traditional, um, maybe not trying to set themselves out too much. Um, though we'll have to see if more of these enter the market, just how they market their products. Well, maybe it's artificial intelligence after all, and the machines do love the plants. <laughs> Another advantage of these uh, technologies is that they can have a variety of possible scales. There's been some concept designs uh, looking at small, you know, urban food kiosks, as you can see here on the left, compared to uh, also there's always been designs for larger urban farms, as you can see on the right. We use Gotham Greens here again. Um, and this local foods kiosk in particular might be able to produce uh, farms all year long, uh, fresh food all year long and very close to residential areas and things like that, so people can just, you know, walk out and get them, or they may get something on their way to work. Um, so there could be a lot of different uh, possibilities there. However, um, we think on scale, the cost of the larger farms will probably be cheaper uh, than having to employ all these technologies for small um, yield and small uh, production. So uh, we have a variety of poll questions here, Q4, Q5, and Q6. Um, we'll go ahead based on these last two slides. So the first here is, you know, would you purchase uh, food from an unstaffed and automated greenhouse? Um, the second is, would local food consumers consider this a local foods product? And six is, we'll answer after these two. There we go. Um, yeah, would uh, consumers prefer small-scale automated kiosks over traditional farmers markets? Assuming the kiosks were located in a you know close, in a, uh, relatively closer to them. So it's interesting, we get a, uh, as the results come in here on our questions, we have a relatively positive interpretation, um, most of these, uh, that they would be considered a local foods product um, and that they would also uh, purchase uh, food from these areas. Um, however, it's definitely, uh, I think it's, it remains to be seen just what form these technologies will take, but um, it's interesting you see a you know, relative uh, amount of positivism, positivity about it. Mark. Curious about re reply to number six. It sounds like um, that one is a little less uh, clear. That it, so why are people going to farmers markets? Are they going for the experience or are they going for the local? And feel free to uh, place comments in the chat. We got zero people saying it was very likely. So clearly, there's a little something going on there. There's certainly literature about, um, you know, partly being the experience, um, but I also think these kiosks, it makes me think of gas station sushi, and so I, I'm a little bit skeptical. Another uh, thing about the uh, farmers markets is we would just like to know um, if there is a connotation to community in local foods as well, or if it's just regulated to the farmers markets based on the discrepancy in the uh, polling. I think Tamara has a good point here that uh, the that's the sense of community, and so I think uh, I think that's a that's a that's a big fact, and also I think this this demographic idea that would be. Uh, um, um, very interesting thing to think about um, in terms of you know which which communities are they more affluent communities uh, more rural communities um, um, you know what uh, would it look like yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the Tamara comment seems to resonate it's you know people are going there for the experience right they they want to they want to live in it you know they want to interact with other people in the community. And the, the, the kiosk would be a little bit colder experience. You know, it, 
might be local and it might be fresh, but it's not um, as kind of lose that human touch. Yeah, I have to you point to Mary on about the uh, food safety and monitoring um, for those small things, especially when you you know you see the food right you know right there, um, especially in an urban environment um, with lots of transit through, unlike you know like individual private farms. Um, and we actually uh, in the negative, we also talk, talk a little bit on demographics as well later in the presentation, but I think that's a really important and interesting point on just how these might vary. So we look forward to hearing any comments about that. Uh, I'll move ahead a bit, but feel free, everyone, to keep commenting. Um, so our question as we continue is the impact on local and regional food systems. Um, and this is really important. We're wondering just what role local foods producers right now would play in these uh, uh, new technologies. Would they you know, become consultants for helping these farms? Would they be opposed to them? Um, what's their role in these new generation of automated technologies here? And um, we have a question to gauge just that, actually. Q7 and um, Q8. And we're also interested in whether these farmers would move to these new areas or if, and in general, if people would move from rural areas to new areas if uh, more agricultural production occurs in cities through these greenhouses just in general, as well as Q8 real being what more is, uh, what role these farmers would be playing. Related to our previous discussion, I think, so Ken's got a good point too, that there's a, a strong social value in interacting with your local farmer or producer. And I mean, that's part of the, I think that's fits into that kind of broader feeling of community, but, but you know, knowing who your food is produced by. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that these technologies definitely don't have, even if they, um, you know, try to market it as grown with love. Um, I think they're probably aware, it looks like that they're at least aware of the concerns about the social uh, value of these, uh, of the traditional experience, and they're trying to counter that. Um, however, I think time will show whether they're successful in that or not. Um, looks like the vast majority for Q7 believe that it's relatively unlikely that there'll be increased uh, rural out-migration in any form, and that uh, pretty unsure or unlikely to possibly some likely on um, farmers would be involved, um, local farmers would be involved in these new technologies. So, so far, just in general, it doesn't look like a lot of local farmers are involved in the current um, farms already operational. From like, this is another example of LUFA farms in Canada, but there's a, uh, or in Brooklyn or in Iron Ox, it looks like it's mainly STEM guys, uh, engineering people, um, and then some other researcher, researchers um, are the main uh, motivating force in these uh, developments. So uh, local food systems uh, also improving food access in urban areas. Uh, greenhouses make food more affordable, and they could possibly lo be located in food deserts, though doesn't mean they will be. And there's possible improvements to quality of life in urban areas if there's uh, fresh local food. Um, provided all year long. However, um, these technologies might be expensive. They, the demographics in you know, uh, areas with low food access may not be ideal uh, demographics for who these companies are trying to market for. Uh, they may want to charge higher prices um, and look for more luxury food demographic. Um, so not quite sure, but we'd like to ask everyone's opinion on this with a full question here on Q9. It's just do you think that these will actually improve food security for most urban residents, or will they be focused more on, you know, uh, fewer select demographics of urban re residents? Well, just by a margin, it looks like most people uh, are 
looking at uh, likely that they will be, which is uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, if anyone has any comments, feel free to place them in the chat. I think with the way the questions are skewing, there's also some uncertainty about how this will shake out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that uncertainty is uh, very much warranted. There's These technologies are very, very um, new. And as we said in the beginning, it's just, it's just so hard to know just exactly how this will turn out. Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. Yeah, that's we're thinking maybe the smaller kiosks could be placed area there. Multiple people are typing, but I'll uh, keep typing. I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, so uh, there are possible uh, regional effects as well uh, with these technologies. So the first one is uh, building off food deserts is will urban form in general change? Um, so we have two potential options we think here um, besides uh, and then in addition to no change at all. And the first one is sprawl caused from the lack of uh, necessity of surrounding farms close to the city to produce food and you know placing urban uh, food production as increasingly important. Uh, being that real estate open development. And the second one is actually more urbanization and density, uh, people trying to build you know, new structures, new residential areas around or close to these new food production structures. So we'd like to ask just what people think the effect will be on that. And um, right here. Yeah, I never thought about um, uh, placing them inside of uh, other locations or things that people are already visiting. That, that's a really good idea. Might help soothe some of that anxiety as well about the quality and uh, things if they're you know located within an established uh, vendor that people trust. I think Mary Beth has a good point too in terms of uh, partnering with non uh, profits. And so it seems like uh, for some of these areas, yeah, certainly there's going to have to be some sort of a partnership just to get the technology to uh, catch on and feel uh, acceptable or safe if it's, if it's going to work at all. So um, this one is uncertainty takes the day just uh, on just what will happen. And I think uh, we'll have to wait and see. But it seems like they're... Uh, no one really thinks there'll be more sprawl, which is probably beneficial that these technologies don't cause uh, more urban sprawl. That is, uh, that, that is good. I'm thinking if, uh, just in uh, relation to Tiffany's comment, you'd probably have to partner and they could probably have to like lease their space instead of actually installing the technology themselves. Yeah, I feel like the private sector would have to uh, divvy up the funding to make this make this work. Not that the uh, uh, nonprofits would be undertaking this themselves, but more utilizing additional uh, utilizing their space as a resource. And Lee has an interesting comment about how this could encourage denser development overall. Um, you know, part of a larger urban planning uh, project. And it, we, it'd be interesting to see in, uh, you know, non-American cities how that would work as well. So uh, another uh, part of this is most of these, as you've seen, produce specialty crops. And um, they can also produce things like, you know, tomatoes or uh, avocados, things that require significantly high inputs. And we compete with... Uh, foreign countries for a lot of that. So our question here is just, do you think that this will reduce imports and exports? Um, sorry, reduce imports and possibly increase exports. Um, we think most likely reducing imports would be the, the most likely out of those two scenarios. Um, however, if you think that there'd be a significant increase in exports for any of these, then feel free to comment.
We're also interested if you think people will consume more of these specialty crops, like uh, if demand will rise to meet any increasing supply, or if the uh, demand is relatively uh, static for these uh, crops. Okay. So thank you for your uh, results there. Oh, click twice. I apologize. Um, here uh, is the final uh, part of our urban plan is, will this help with using unused industrial land, new jobs and investment for Rust Belt cities? Um, we can look here at some concept art from Seattle about uh, repurposing old land and creating these new urban greenhouses. That actually is one of their designs for an urban greenhouse. Um, but there could be a variety of designs that vary based on the state of the industrial land itself, whether it requires total demolition or not. Um, if it's still structurally sound, it could be repurposed to be something like aerial farms, um, where you have, you know, a warehouse style structure with those grow boxes inside of it. Um, however, uh, the question there is just, uh, will it bring in increased investment and increased tax revenue for these cities? And will this help uh, stimulate local economies and help revitalize these areas for Q12 and Q13? And feel free to place any comments again in the chat box. So it looks like uh, most people believe that it, it could help stimulate these local economies and help revitalize these areas to at least some degree. Um, and that's uh, quite interesting. If there's any cities in particular that you think might benefit, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And on that note, I will uh, wrap up. Uh, the presentation part of the presentation before we move on to Q&A. You can keep placing your comments in the chat. We'll just answer them when they get to the Q&A section first. So general conclusion here um, is possible effects and bullet points uh, based on is increased centralization of agricultural production and urban density. It looks like uh, a majority of people here believe that is possible. Um, increased rural outmigration looks like it's going to, from the polls here, looks like it would be relatively unlikely. Uh, new job opportunities and tax revenue for cities, it seems like uh, there's a level of optimism about this. Um, obviously, uh, some cautious optimism, but could, could be a possibility. And then finally, uh, decreased imports from Mexico, more uncertainty here, and possible increased local spending and investment uh, seem to be more positive. And those are just the general core points from these potentials. Um, yeah, so I'll move on to the uh, Q&A. So um, feel free to place any additional questions that we didn't concern or any additional comments here. I think it would be, uh, I, I think Detroit uh, could definitely help as well. Uh, sorry, not to help, but I think Detroit could also uh, be a target for these areas as well. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up the screen real quick so we can see the uh, Q&A. So sorry, that'll disrupt your typing just a little bit, um, but it'll help us uh, see the uh, feedback a little bit better. Um, so yeah, so this this idea of it being conditional on the, uh, the, the place and also the circumstances of the place is, um, I think, a pretty interesting idea. That would kind of set it up as a maybe not a one size fits all, but maybe uh, the strategies would be uh, you know kind of mix and match based on the the specific needs. In response to uh, Megan's question, we haven't yet seen any significant public policy um, responses or incentives for these uh, technologies. Um, at least looking at these own startups, they look mainly uh, from what we can understand, they're mainly private ventures with uh, some have venture capital funding if they do declare it. 
um, but not a lot of uh, cooperation with public government and such. They focus heavily on their marketing and trying to privately bring these things to uh, you know urban food to consumers. However, there may be examples we're missing um, that they have uh, been involved or maybe just not at this level. I thought uh, Mary Beth's um, comment about uh, you know the, the idea of, of using it for PR or tax write-off was kind of an interesting twist as well. <clears throat> and in response to Lee's question, for the purpose here, we're looking more at like um, agriculture within um, or adjacent to the metropolitan area itself. Um, more than just, uh, but at least could possibly, you know, uh, expand beyond that. I think that actually, in terms of uh, calling it local with the technologies, I think that would be a, a major factor. So, would this be something that the uh, the producers in the in the in the given community are contributing to, or is it something that gets stocked uh, from producers, you know, maybe a uh, hundred miles away, but within the same state borders? Um, that would that's also an interesting thing to think about in terms of, of how to make the technology work to keep up uh, certain expectations with uh, quality and such and consistency I guess but if it's thrown right in the kiosk how could it not be local well yeah but then I guess the question is is, is who's managing the thing and who gets the benefit from it because I think that's another piece of the the local food story Um, I think the for uh, in regards to the energy intensity um, is you have to incorporate uh, some level of renewable energy technology into these designs um, that actually the field technologies have an advantage in. You'll see a lot of the field robots um, that they're designing, though not the purpose of this webinar, being attached with like solar panels on their back and things like that, like the back of the robot, quote unquote, um, or the implement, depending on the design. Um, the, these would have to just, I think you'd probably have to change the construction of the building itself, and it may not be directly linked to these implements as much as it is just uh, into advanced, you know, urban design and sustainable urban uh, architecture. So I think it's a, I think it's a drawback at the moment um, of the energy intensity um, that these designs don't directly address. And Scott or John, if you have any uh, comments or you know disagree or whatever, something else. Sure, I, I still am, am thinking a little bit about this idea of of, of local and um, and how this might you know impact the uh, rede redefining local um, because again it's like who is in charge of the the facility if the if a you know it's a local nonprofit group or something like that has that and the stuff is like physically grown there then. I think that absolutely fits, but if this is, uh, you know, owned by uh, some larger corporation or something like that, um, I, I just wonder how the perce how the perception is received, even though it's like physically being grown right there. Um, so, and these all require electrical input. So I think uh, Tamara's comment on using renewable energy uh, definitely definitely fits. Um, I think there's a lot of possible solutions to that that are more into like the design of the farm if they plan for that and build for it. I think they could possibly. Uh, you know, prepare for that. Or if the cities themselves plan and build for that, going back to earlier comments, you know, working together with these urban tech to help facilitate that and uh, on a larger urban s scale. Well, it looks like we've got uh, uh, kind of a slowdown in terms of responses into the chat box. We've got a, a, a lot of feedback on the, uh, the poll questions, and so uh, that's very much appreciated, and we've got some good uh, good thoughts and some good questions in the uh, in the chat box itself. So, um, and unless I see some more writing in the chat box, I think we'll we'll kind of move this in the direction of wrapping up. So, um, in, in parting, uh, Scott, do you have any uh, any parting thoughts or any kind of uh, uh, comments? Do you want to you want to leave for the audience? Well, this is obviously a rapidly evolving field, and um, I think the comments that have come in through the chat have been really helpful in helping us think about 
the ways in which this might evolve. Um, I'm sure we'll all be wrong 10 years from now. That's the way these things are, go, but uh, it's certainly fun to be thinking about all the possibilities um, and uh, how we might, uh, as, as a society, start to take advantage of these emerging technologies in ways that uh, benefit uh, local communities. So I appreciate everybody's input today. Yeah, thank you for that. Spencer, any, any parting thoughts for you? Well, I just want to thank again everyone for attending and listening in. Uh, we really appreciate all your feedback, and it's really useful to us. And uh, we thank you for your time here. Um, so, yeah, I just want to say thanks to everybody, I guess. And thanks to John and Scott again and uh, Rose as well. And that's it for me. Great. Well, I'm going to echo uh, those sentiments, and thank you for participating. Um, again, if you'd like a recording of this webinar, it will should be on the uh, NCRCRD website. I've got the URL in the chat box up there at the very top, and it should be there in the next couple of days. And uh, with that, uh, thanks again for participating, and that concludes our webinar. <laughs>